Some murders go unsolved. Killers slip through the cracks. Time passes, families lose hope. News Center 7 investigates Miami Valley murder mysteries. Good evening, I'm Cheryl McHenry. And I'm James Brown. Tonight, the story of four local murder victims and their grieving families who want answers. We begin in Kettering, where a young woman was attacked and killed in her bedroom. 25 years later, her family is still seeking justice. Becky Grimes has our story. I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I felt something was wrong. I knew she would be up early, so I called about 8 o'clock. The phone just rang and rang and rang. Her voicemail didn't come on. So I called her father and asked that he go check on her. When Don Goff got to the house he owned in Kettering, the house where his daughter was living on Carew Avenue, something was very wrong. He called and said, Karen's gone, Karen's dead. Their 20-year-old daughter, Karen, had been murdered in her bedroom. He climbed in the window uh, while she was in the shower. Apparently, she fought him. The house was all a mess. He had cut the phone cords. Karen was battered, bloodied, raped, and strangled. I don't believe she knew him, but I believe he approached her, and she rejected him. Now, 25 years after Karen's murder here in Kettering, that man is still a free man. Mary Beth thought no one cared anymore, but we've learned that's not true. There is someone opening dusty boxes. And you start by making sure all your evidence is still there. Going back in time. And you go through and you read the file. To hunt for a killer who thinks the search is off. I'm just dealing with cold facts on paper and pictures. Vincent Mason is among a special breed of detectives investigating cold cases of murder like this one. It's part old-fashioned police work and part new crime fighting technology. My hope is to figure out, either with DNA or with somebody giving me a call and helping out, figure out who did this. I just want to try to give mom something because we couldn't give dad the answer he was looking for. He died without knowing. Yeah, he did. It's very sad and I don't want to, I don't want mom to have that problem. So Detective Mason is getting to know the victim. Karen Goff spent her early years in Dayton, but she and her brother moved to Atlanta with their mother. She graduated high school there in 1985 after battling a learning disability. That was the happiest day of her life when she graduated. Karen returned to Dayton to be with her father. He had a rental home and she wanted to spread her wings a little bit, so he let her live there by herself. She was fun-loving. Uh, she uh, was also insecure. She um, wanted to be loved and accepted by others. She was a little bit too trusting. Her career that she wanted was to fall in love and get married and have a family. She spent her last day with a boyfriend and some other friends who stopped by at the Carew Avenue house. She also had a late doctor's appointment. I got home, talked to a friend on the phone about one in the morning, um, and after that, there's no other contact with anybody outside the house that I know of. Mason is also getting to know the crime scene. It's a nice, quiet residential street, and the neighbors are close enough that if something loud were to have happened, they might have heard something, and they didn't. The curtains were closed. The front door locked. Dad did use a key to come through the front door. Old video of the crime scene shows signs of disarray in the living room, signs of a recent shower in the bathroom with wet bath mat and towels and signs of a struggle and violent death in the master bedroom. We can't show you the bed where Karen was found, but we can show you other evidence in the room. This is just a little nightstand like where she would do her hair and things. There's a curling iron and hair, hair dryer there. Uh, the first medic on scene did shut the curling iron off. It was hot at the time when they got there. Was Karen getting ready to go out? Old police reports say she loved the Bourbon Street nightclub on Woodman Drive. She danced there three, four nights a week with a group of friends. It's believed she may have met her killer there. I don't believe she knew him well. I think she just tried, you know, she avoided him and, um, and he stalked her. I would say to him that um, I believe in karma. I believe that if you came forward, justice would be served. If you choose not to come forward, uh, you'll answer to a higher authority afterwards. 
If Karen were alive today, she would have been 45 on August 12th. Mary Beth visits her daughter's final resting place on birthdays, holidays, and the anniversary of her death. It gives me a sense of closeness to her. She is hoping that someone watching right now who may have information will make a call. I pray every day, um, you know, that the suspect will either come forward or somebody will say something or remember something that will uh, bring the case to a close so everybody can rest in peace, including Karen. If you have information about the 1987 murder of Karen Goff, call Kettering Police Detective Vincent Mason at 937-296-2583. I know whoever he opened the door to, he knew him. He had to know him. But who was it next? The mystery surrounding the murder of a church organist. The mysteries now continue. Corey Turner was a longtime substitute teacher in Dayton. And a popular organist at his church, but somebody killed him in cold blood. John Paul has our story. He's an old time God. Yeah, yes, he, is. he was always here, always on time. Oh, yeah. And he always prepared you for what was going to happen. But Corey Turner could not have prepared his choir for this. I cried and I cried and I cried. By all accounts, the vibrant choir director of 12 years and public school teacher was an angel. He was just so pure and so honest. Before the murder, Turner was preparing for a Christmas concert at Greater Allen Church that he produced and had stepped up the practice schedule. That last week we was going to rehearse every night. He was a perfectionist, and that's why it was so strange when he never showed up. At first, the choir played it off. He's running a little late, so we're just going to move on. But when he missed practice again the next night, panic set in. Shirley said, something's wrong. I said, yes, if he's not here, something is wrong. We couldn't continue on because there was, it, was just, it just didn't feel right. They rushed out to his apartment on Riverside Drive that night and begged management to let them inside. His light was on in his bedroom, so they said they couldn't go in either. I said, well, you got to do something. You know, he could be in there and need help. You see, Turner lived all by himself, the only one in the entire complex. I kept saying, cool, you got to move out of this apartment. You're the only one over here. And he was going to move that next week. But he never got that chance. After talking with management, deputies went into the apartment. It finally happened. Maintenance was allowed to go in and unlock the door along with the sheriff's department. And this is the discovery of Corey's body. The 39-year-old choir director, a man who dedicated his life to God and children, had been shot to death. Walk me through what you know happened. What do you guys know about that night? Well, what we know about that night is uh, he, he was at church. Um, he left there around 9 o'clock. Uh, he made a couple of stops at a gas station, and then he went to uh, JJ's Fish Market right up the street. Uh, he got him a meal. He left there around uh, 11.45. Detective Brad Darty has not given up on this case. You know, we didn't get any phone calls that night of any type of disturbance or an argument or anything because there's nobody around here that you know would have heard you know what happened. They can't go into exactly where Turner was found in the apartment, only that he probably knew his killer because there were no signs of forced entry, no signs of a struggle. His car and credit cards were also missing. They have surveillance video of the car with someone at the wheel at a drive through using Turner's credit cards. Uh, some of the items that were bought appear to be items um, that you would buy a child for Christmas. But they couldn't see the driver's face, the surveillance totally useless. A break came a week later. Turner's stolen Honda was discovered parked on Lakeview. Inside, police recovered DNA. Right now, it's still being analyzed at the crime lab, but because they do work for 37 counties, it's taking a long time. Detectives want answers now. You know, somebody knows what happened to this guy. The choir is carrying on, trying to get back to normal, with Corey never too far from their minds.
I had to direct a song that he taught us. It was hard, because I looked over to the organ, got next to me. They all hope this cold case can be solved before another Christmas goes by. If you have any information about the murder of Corey Turner, call Detective Darty at 937-478-0772. A very unlikely place for murder and two very unlikely victims. It's a very atypical homicide investigation. It's a true whodunit. The mystery continues when we come back. The mysteries now continue. Now the baffling murders of two loved and respected members of a local farming community. And now we've learned there's a $10,000 reward for information about this crime. The unmistakable rhythm of the auctioneer's chant, peddling the possessions of the father and daughter who lived here. The warm summer day, a sharp contrast to cold and snowy November 30th, when Bob and Colleen Gruby were found murdered in their rural farmhouse near Fort Recovery. It's been nine months, but it feels like it's been five years. Time drags for Bob Gruby's five remaining children who remember the morning they lost their dad and their favorite sibling. Well, I was just at work and Cass had called me earlier and said Colleen didn't show up to babysit the kids. And that was unusual. Oh, yeah. 47-year-old Colleen Gruby lived with and cared for their widowed father, who'd suffered a series of strokes and used a wheelchair to get around. Colleen also babysat the three children of her brother Adrian and his wife Cassie. When Colleen didn't show that Wednesday and didn't answer any phone calls, Adrian suggested Cassie make the short drive to her in-law's house. Had I known, she would have never been out. Nobody should have seen that. They were both found uh, bound with duct tape and um, they were both shot and killed. Um, a very horrific scene. Mercer County Sheriff's Detective Doug Timmerman was one of the first two officers on the scene after Cassie Gruby called 911. He's worked the case ever since. Within days, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation assigned Special Agent Roger Davis to work side by side with Timmerman until they solved this murder mystery. It's a very atypical homicide investigation. It's a true whodunit. What makes it so are the victims themselves. The investigators describe Bob and Colleen Gruby as two very low-risk victims who lived modestly and had no enemies. Their family says they were trusting people who left their doors unlocked and would help anyone. Whoever stopped, whatever the reason, they were said, come on in, have a seat. Do you need a cup of coffee? Do you need, do you, do you need something to eat? Do you need to use the phone? They were just giving people. The detectives know Colleen Gruby left her brother's house to go home around 5 p.m. on Tuesday, November 29th. Sometime after that, they believe the killers chose the house on Burville Road at random. Their investigation reveals at least one man and one woman were there, though they can't divulge how they know that. The killers ransacked the house, stealing a laptop and other items. We do feel that maybe a robbery or theft wasn't possibly the purpose that these people went to the house. The crime scene showed no signs of a struggle, indicating the Groobies cooperated as they were bound with duct tape, Colleen on a couch, Bob still in his wheelchair, both rendered helpless and then shot to death. Every night I lay down, I don't know how they sleep, the people that did this, because every night and I didn't see it, and I sure yeah. picture it every night. The hardest thing is not knowing why or who. Those are the two questions that I really want answered. Who did it and why did they do it? Those are the questions Detectives Timmerman and Davis are working to answer. They've collected an enormous amount of evidence and interviewed over 200 people, some of them more than once. These are interview tapes on just one person. One person? Yeah, and then this would be the rest on everybody else. They've obtained 137 grand jury subpoenas for evidence, including cell phone records. They've conducted 15 search warrants, and they have identified some persons of interest, though no one they're ready to call a suspect. Bob and Colleen Gruby are buried here at St. Joe Cemetery. Their grave markers give no indication of the violent manner in which they died. Instead, they're a loving tribute to the way they lived.
Bob's tombstone reflects his stint in the Navy before coming home to Mercer County to work and raise a family with wife Alice. Colleen's marker bears the names of the 12 children she adored and images of her favorite animal. She didn't have kids of her own and her nieces and nephews were everything to her and she collected pigs, she loved pigs. An anonymous donor has now come forward with a $10,000 reward for information that would solve the murders of these two beloved people. Detectives have gathered several pieces of the puzzle, but something is still missing. I really do think one piece and an important piece of the puzzle will create a domino effect and this case will be solved. We're committed to the community of Mercer County and the state of Ohio to, to find the people responsible for Robert and Colleen's death. Until those responsible are found, the detectives won't rest. Neither will those who loved Bob and Colleen Gruby. We live every day with big holes in our hearts that haven't quite healed, and we can't heal until whoever knows what happened steps forward and says, I can't let this family suffer anymore. We suffer every day. Please call the Mercer County Sheriff's Office tip line at 567-890-TIPS. Your tip can remain anonymous. You can also post information anonymously on GroobyMemorial.com. A woman and her unborn child die in a violent way. That was my baby and she didn't deserve that. She didn't deserve what she got. Our murder mystery continues in two minutes. The mysteries now continue. Carla Renee Davis was six months pregnant, and what her killer did to her, investigators say, was one of the most gruesome crimes they had ever seen. All these years later, that murder still haunts her mother. It's time I could, I couldn't save her. I wasn't there to say goodbye. And the only thing I'm going to say is, Carla, I'm so sorry I wasn't there to help you. I'm so sorry I wasn't there. Will you take your last breath? I'm sorry I wasn't there to hold you in my arms. And I'm sorry that I let you down. My baby, I miss my friend. 13 years later, Rosetta Bird still struggles with not knowing who the killer is. In the early morning hours of August 11th, 1999, somebody attacked and beat 21-year-old Carla Renee Davis. Then the killer set her body on fire. When you burn a body and you're looking at it as you're dumping gasoline and throwing that is anger. That is mean. That is a person who will never have a conscience. Tackett works in the Dayton Police Department's cold case unit. It is her job to work on these unsolved murders. It's a pretty large case file. Just recently, Tackett opened back up Davis's case. And for her, that means seeing all the evidence for the first time. Tackett said the initial investigators in 1999 did everything they could to find Davis's killer. Those detectives said this to Channel 7 in the days and weeks after Carla's murder. We're pretty thorough and uh, we'll get to the bottom of sooner or later. It is no doubt in my mind that the person who murdered Carla has revealed that information to others. But that one missing link to this murder investigation never came. This is just one of those maybe 15 cases in over 15 years that uh, that I can't forget. White investigated hundreds of murder cases up until his retirement about a year and a half ago. Today, there is no doubt in White's mind the killer told others about what happened that night in 1999. That night, Carla was in her mother's home on Annapolis Avenue in Dayton. Carla's mom went to bed, and for whatever reason, between 11.30 and midnight, Carla left the house. About nine hours later, 
somebody driving along Stony Hollow Road spotted Carla's body. Right away, investigators knew it was going to be a challenge just to find witnesses here on Stony Hollow. Oh, this is when she was two. <laughs> Photo albums of her daughter's short life help ease Rosetta's pain a bit. But as she turns the pages, she cannot fight back the tears. This is the baby. This is Cassius. Cassius was Carla's first baby, her little pride and joy. But less than two months after Cassius was born, he was killed, a victim of shaken baby syndrome. Yeah, I think my baby's dead. Okay, is the baby breathing? No! Okay, how long? Is Carla's boyfriend and the baby's father, Teray Lewis, was arrested. Later, he was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and served two years in prison. While awaiting trial, though, Lewis and Carla continued their relationship, and Carla got pregnant again with Lewis's child. She was fun to be around. A year after burying her grandson, she buried her daughter and her unborn granddaughter. They would have named her Brandy. Carla's room is still as she left it in 1999. Her stuffed animals, her hairbrushes all have their place. During our most recent interview, Rosetta said it's just too difficult, too painful for her to deal with. Part of our interview with Carla's mother, we shared with investigators. Put yourself in my shoes, or any mother's shoes, that have lost their child to violence. She deserves to have the person that is responsible for Carla's, Carla's murder to be uh, brought to justice, to be identified and, and to be punished. And all these years later, yeah. Carla's family and police are pleading, practically begging, that somebody in our community helps them find Carla's killer. It breaks my heart and um, and I see this. It, it, that's why I do what I do. Please call. I'm begging you to call because that was my baby and she didn't deserve that. Whoever it was, you better pray one day that you don't have to go through this. You better pray one day that it's not your mother or your sister or anybody in your family to go through this because then you will feel the hurt that I'm hurting. One call could help ease this pain. Anybody who has information about the murder of Carla Davis and her unborn child, cold case detective Patricia Tackett, would appreciate a call. Her number, 333-7109. Join us right now on Facebook for more conversation about these crimes. And the mystery continues in Sunday's Dayton Daily News. Find out who's missing in the Miami Valley. These families need answers, so please make that call. Thank you for watching. Good night.